Thank you very much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here in uh, Uppsala with you this morning. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me for, for this talk. Um, this conference is about uh, food security, zero hunger for 2030. And there is uh, indeed actually a lot of debates and controversy uh, at the global scale, at the local scales, on the, the best pathways to achieve um, this uh, objective. And today, uh, we try to discuss with you how the diversified agroecological coping system may be a solution for food security in the low-income countries. So we try to use that, yeah, it works. <laughs> So, uh, today, we, many people consider that the world is generally uh, food secure and that we are producing enough food to meet the dietary needs of today's global population. As you can see on the graph, the orange line, which is the production, uh, have the same trend, but the yellow line, which represents the consumption and, and, and the needs. And when it differs, you can see that the stocks, which are the gray bars, are, are adapting. And in addition, uh, the global trade at uh, the global scale stabilizes the food availability and the prices for most of the countries. But uh, this uh, occurs with high, very high differences in uh, the land productivity. Uh, as, we, as you can see on, on this graph, the x-axis is the average productivity per nations, and you have a contribution to the world total uh, food production on the y-axis. And what, what, what you can see is that countries with very low average productivity contribute a lot uh, to the global food production. And for instance, you have Asia and Africa are contributing for more than 40% of the world total cereal production. Uh, on the opposite, you can see that the USA and the West uh, European Union contribute only for a little bit more than 10% of the world total cereal production. That's what we generally uh, have uh, in mind. And we have to emphasize also the low productivity in Asia and, uh, and of course, uh, Africa. So the thing we have to think about is that the global uh, food production depends a lot of the family farming and very small farms, less than two hectares uh, in the world. The second point is that the global cereal yields have increased a lot um, in uh, different continents, uh, you can see uh, the, the curves, uh, the upper curves, which represent uh, the developed countries, Asia in red. And the problem is for Sub-Saharan Africa, as, as this was already emphasized before, that well, the, the yields increased, but very uh, at, at a different rate. And this productivity increase in the different continents in Europe or Asia was possible because of the rules of the new cultivars and increase at the external inputs, but with very high uh, environmental costs. But the situation now in, in Africa uh, has to um, take attention for, for, from us. And when we are looking at the food availability at the national level, we can see uh, that countries uh, which are not self-sufficient are in red on, on this map. And these are mainly uh, countries in Africa and also a little bit in, uh, in Asia. And in addition, some of these countries who, which necessitate uh, importations uh, of, uh, of food uh, are also uh, not sufficient at all. These are the vertical stripes. So there is a high dependency on, on imports for these red countries. And as you can see on this uh, other map, uh, remain also more than 800 million uh, people who are undernourished. We already said this in the previous presentation. And this has been on the rise. Uh, and it's more than 10% of the global population. And as you can see here, it's mainly also Africa and uh, some part of, uh, of Asia. So there are also accessibility issues. So the first point I would like to emphasize is that food availability is still an important pillar of food security, but 
the global uh, food produce is equivalent to the global dietary needs. But this, uh, there is a high prevalence of uh, food insecure populations uh, in, in, in developing countries and mainly in Africa. So with accessibility issue. And the last point here is that the global food production depends on, on family farming and very small farms. So the question we have now is, should agricultural production be increased in the next decades? How can we do for that? Uh, again, I have to uh, insist also on the population growth projection that we have. And if we look at the uh, median curve in, in blue here, and this is the same graph as we already see, so I will go, very, I will go fast on that. Uh, you see that uh, uh, Asia will pick uh, the population in 2050, but Africa will still uh, grow a lot and around double uh, the, the population up to 2050. So the population growth in the world will be driven by African demographic growth in the next decades. So when we look now at the food demand projection, uh, there, were, there is a lot of literature about that, and we can see that uh, all the, the studies show that uh, the food uh, production will need to be increased from 30% to uh, 90%. This depends on the models which are used, but also with the different scenarios regarding uh, population growth, you have seen there are some uh, uncertainties with that, but also economic growth at the global scale and the evolution of the diet. But the, ex so the expectation for 2050 is more than 30 from to 90% of world food needs. But we want to emphasize on the importance to increase the national food availability, especially for the poor countries. Uh, and the necessity to limit the dependency to imports and market variability, to ensure the local food availability in places with poor infrastructures, and to increase income locally for the poor agricultural households. And this is a need to develop local economy, and this is also the role of uh, agriculture in the developing countries. So at this stage, we have to remember that the population growth is driven by African demographic growth in the future decades, but the world food production demand will be more than 30% in all scenarios, that there is a food availability issue very important at the national level in the developing countries, and there is so the importance to increase the national food availability for the development of local economies in, in the develop developing countries. So what are the main challenges for, to success for this and the, for the food availability? Uh, first, there are uncertainties regarding diet transition in the world, at the world scale. Uh, despite the fact that some uh, groups are eating less and less meat in the developing countries, what you can see here is that the consumption of meat increases in all countries uh, in relation with the, the richness, wealth, wealth of, a, of, a, of a people and the number of their revenues. And there is this Bennett laws that say that as people become wealthier, uh, they switch from simple starchy plants, diets, to more varied food uh, diets that includes more uh, meats. Of course, there are um, cultural uh, differences and as you can see, Japan is, of course, less meat than the United States. And when you compare India to China, also there are all these uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, habits that are important. But globally, the consumption of meat is increasing with uh, revenues. The second challenge for food availability is the climate change, of course, and the relationship with uh, climate change and food production. Uh, I just show here uh, the result of, of a meta-analysis on more than 1,000 studies on yields, mainly uh, cereals um, that were done, um, and they were uh, reported here. And as you can see, uh, so uh, the blue uh, boxes show the increases in yields with climate change, and the yellow one, the decreases in yields. 
And as you go to in the future, when you go to the right, you go to in the future studies, and you can see the proportion of uh, studies showing that, that yields will increase is decreasing, and the proportion of, uh, of uh, studies showing that the yields will uh, decrease is uh, increasing. So things, uh, the more we go in the future, the more uh, dramatic will be uh, the situations. And this is also, oh, sorry, okay. And when we look at the geographic situation, uh, this is also more dramatic because the, um, the production will increase in temperate countries due to the increase of temperature, of course, but we, you can see that, that all the countries that were suffering for food availability already right now will be affected by decreasing in yields in the next uh, decade. It's all the tropical countries to be um, roughly. So there are a lot of negative impacts and projected are projected in many areas who are already highly dependent on uh, agriculture today. Another challenge is, of course, the environmental constraints and the relation to food production. This is a, a big driver today. Uh, as you say, uh, agriculture has negative impacts worldwide on the forest loss and fragmentation with the loss of forests. Um, agriculture is also a high contributor to uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, it has a major role in the biodiversity loss worldwide and also um, on the soil resources. So there are all these uh, major uh, uh, impacts that we have to take into account. So just to remember at that stage, uh, the um, challenges are the, the diet transition, but we don't know exactly what will be, but we can expect a higher demand on the meat in the next decades. Uh, the climate change, of course, is a major um, uh, issue with large negative impacts that, that are projected in many areas, and especially the, the poorest countries. And uh, lastly, that the food production is facing resource scarcity. Uh, I didn't speak of that, but this is very important for uh, potassium, for instance, and there are these environmental issues. So how to increase the food availability? Uh, when we look at the crop production uh, since the 60s, it has increased a lot, and with not a lot of uh, evolution on the arable land, and this is, was due to uh, the high use of fertilizers. And I didn't mention here the pesticides, which show uh, also a big crisis. But this is not sustainable anymore, as we, we know in our uh, agriculture here, and so there is need to find new way uh, to improve food availabilities. So what can we do? Increase cropland, this is not much possible. We know in most of areas, uh, we know the importance to keep uh, the natural areas. Reducing biofuel production can be a, a small solution. Changing diets, of course, but it's difficult. Increasing the production limits with new varieties. Reducing wastes and losses. Closing the yield gaps, all are, are part of the solutions. But in any way, we'll need to uh, design a new system that can combine all these different things. So this is a great challenge for the agronomists and the scientists in the future, with an objective to achieve a sufficient production in quantity and quality to satisfy the increasing and changing demand the economic profitability and social development for small farmers in the developing country mainly, and, and in the same time also to preserve the environment and the limitation of risks uh, for humans and ecosystems, uh, which are the use of the pesticide in general. So which cropping systems uh, to address these different objectives? So we are mainly working on solutions based on ecological uh, intensification, and the development of uh, agroecology. Uh, this is based on the reflection that we had in the first presentation also um, with uh, Linhart on the comparison of between natural ecosystems and agrosystems. We know that natural ecosystems uh, are based on high species richness, they are based on spatial heterogeneity, perennial canopy, functional redundancies. All these properties are not in the intensive uh, agricultural systems. 
Uh, they are based on one cultivar, one monoculture, homogeneity, uh, no trees, and all these characteristics are just the opposite of uh, intensive uh, agricultural systems. So can we go towards agro-systems that can, in a sort of, mimic the natural uh, ecosystems? So we are trying to develop this um, uh, solution which already exists in some parts of, of the world. So that means more complex systems going from monocultures to a more complex systems that, that include a number of uh, cultivated uh, spaces and hence we can have um, different benefits uh, from that, uh, ecological benefits, production benefits and different ecos ecosystemic services. So there is a lot of work on that trying to reintroduce a cover plant, uh, different uh, solutions uh, developed by agroecology. Agro so the question we have now is, does this ecological intensification solution work um, in the different situation we have? So we can try to estimate the different pathways. Uh, roughly, uh, there are some different pathways, the conventional pathways, the eco-technical pathways, which is kind of conventional with less uh, use of pesticides. We have the agroecological pathway or the organic also pathway, which is kind of a, uh, another group of solutions which are included, which may be included in the agroecological uh, orientations. And as you can see on this graph, uh, they have all uh, uh, different uh, notes regarding the, the criteria. And uh, we, uh, it's very important to, to look at the, this different uh, uh, criteria at the same time and have to have a metric criteria analysis of a, of a situation we, of a different pathway we want to, to look at. Just I wanted to show you some uh, of the results we have on the strategies of crop diversification uh, who are proposed and these results are from a project uh, Diverse Impact actually uh, underway and uh, try to, um, to look at the impacts of crop diversification on different uh, criteria. Uh, that includes a range of practices that aims at incorporating agrobiodiversity across multiple uh, spatial or temporal, temporal scales. So some are, can be considered as agroecology, uh, some not, but they tried in the study to, uh, some to, to, to bring together all the studies on, on crop diversification. So you can, um, you can have agroforestry, that means bringing trees and crops together in, in different complexity levels. There are so many uh, hundreds of different agro agroforestry types. You can associate plant species, mix, uh, mixture cultivar, intercropping, rotations, or to work on the landscape heterogeneity. Some of the results, um, there is a large con quantity of data that are available on this subject and they studied more than 30,000 experimental results in the world that have been published. This is only uh, uh, published literature. And as you can see, there are also differences uh, on the different type of uh, crop diversification. Uh, there are very few uh, studies on mixture or landscape and much more on rotation. And when you look at where it is done, it's mainly in, in, in the developed countries in the north. So there is a lack also of knowledge on this, these solutions and the published literature, for instance, in Africa, the performances on, on this system in developing countries. Some of the results that we are rapidly here and that show here for three, we choose only three uh, systems here, the rotations, agroforestry, and, and associated plant species. And you can see the, the impact. Uh, so it's always a comparison uh, of the diversified systems against the conventional systems, which is a monoculture, and they look at the, um, in this meta-analysis, the impact on biodiversity in yellow, soil quality and productivity in blue. And as you can see, uh, for most of the studies, there were uh, benefits, uh, positive effects of uh, these systems on the tree uh, situation. It's not always true for productivity, so we have to go back to the result and see what, what is the situation in that, that they uh, very often have positive uh, impacts. 
And this is summarized also here, when you have the ratio of performance, so it's more than one, it's a better, uh, the diverse systems that have a better performance, and as you can see, with agroforestry and rotations together, you combine uh, very good uh, results on productivity. We can do that also. Some meta-analysis have been done, for instance, on organic production. Here are some uh, results that are published also. When they compared on uh, a large quantity of studies, the organic compared to the conventional per unit area. And when you look at it, uh, this, you can see that when you look at the effect of, on biodiversity, soil, climate, water quality, water quantity, on all these uh, criteria, organic production from the results of this uh, meta-analysis uh, has a better performance than the conventional systems. The only problem is for, for productivity. Uh, productivity of organic is still less, according to this study. Uh, they show that it's, in average, a minus 20%, that is quite of, uh, important in productivity, uh, compared to conventional systems. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are not profitable for farmers, because uh, there are other, of course, uh, criteria that take into account in the profitability. They have less um, inputs, for instance. Huh? But the fact is, when looking at the, at the uh, food production, it's, it's still... Uh, less than conventional systems. Um, oh, the one important point to see is that here you have a number of studies, and uh, in green you see the Europe and North America, and you see it's the, the big majority of the studies for these organic studies are for develop, developed countries, and there are very, very few studies on, on, on the, the situation in uh, developing countries. So the performance here is always the yield uh, difference. You see uh, minus 20% in the same study, and there are, you see here all the different uh, meta-analyses uh, that has been done. Uh, this is this synthesis of meta-analyses meta -analysis was done by uh, Verena Seffert here, and you can see it, there are differences depending on crop type, but there is still uh, this uh, lower uh, yields. So what can we uh, say about uh, Africa, about that, the challenges for Africa? And there is this paper uh, from uh, Van Torsum from Wageningen who say that can sub-Saharan Africa feed itself in the next decades? And the, the paper is quite pessimistic regarding uh, the, um, the increase in population uh, that uh, I show you and the, the low uh, gaps, actually, the high yield gap that, that exists in Africa, uh, the thing will be difficult. That, that's the conclusion of, of the paper. Um, when we look at Africa, uh, there is more than one billion people, press this process of urbanization everywhere, and a really increasing population and food demand. Uh, it suppose that the population will double by 2050, with a massive influx of young working uh, age people. And despite the urbanization, the population should remain predominantly rural, uh, and the population density in rural areas will continue to increase also. So a double process of urbanization and increasing the density in rural population too. Some hope with the development of telephony, some progress to access to energy uh, and construction, but when looking at the infrastructure, it's really uh, locally based on the majority of rural areas. They still do not have a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure. Some elements of hope in the growing audience also of farmers' organizations. But this remains really fragile, uh, and there is a metropolisation towards the capital that, uh, that remains, and still this large-scale migration toward the, the cities. In addition, uh, for Africa, you have problems with climate change. We have seen the continent will be impacted more than others. Uh, the already high level of undernourished uh, people and the fact that available arable lands are not so uh, many. They are rare, empty lands and also a complex local land tenure that uh, sometimes uh, is a break for uh, investment also. 
Uh, so how to achieve food security? Uh, so we believe there are solutions uh, towards uh, an agroecologically based uh, agriculture. Uh, when we look at the organic, the certified organic, which is some kind of specific, uh, this is uh, very uh, still uh, low in Africa. Uh, when we look at the situation of that, it's only 3% uh, uh, of uh, uh, arable um, land in Africa, and it's very heterogeneous also. There is a lot of more in uh, East Africa, uh, development of uh, organic, certified organic agriculture, rather than in West Africa, where it's quite uh, rare. And the majority is organic pr produce are exported, so it's very a niche market for now. Uh, but it's interesting to see there are more and more uh, farmer peasant organizations. We are looking for that and trying to make links between uh, rural and uh, city uh, and trying to, uh, to improve that. So the situation will be can organic management increase the yields also in the low input systems in countries in, of the global south? And how can we close the, this organic yield gap? Uh, so we think we have to work also uh, a, lot, a lot on the diversification strategies in, or, in order to, to uh, design systems that are sustainable. But the development of agroecological systems in Africa needs to be progressive and participatory also, and the farmers should be uh, direct protagonists, of course, of the ecological intensification uh, systems uh, development. They have to be part of it, they have to be drivers of the movements, and they should have the opportunity to, to share their, their own experience. So we have some projects that are showing, uh, showing that, but it's all a, a long-time process for that. Uh, so with these multi-actors uh, co-innovation uh, platforms. So the concluding remarks, I don't know if I have been too long or not, uh, concluding remarks, um, is that ecologically uh, intensive farming needs really a specific uh, attention for in, in the developing countries. Uh, it requires uh, ecological engineering at farm and landscape level, not only uh, uh, experiments by researchers, but really work with the farmers and at the landscape and regional level uh, together. It requires an ability to engage with local actors and learn from, uh, from each other. Uh, agroecology is not like uh, conventional agriculture. They are not already made solutions. So it all has to be experimented uh, with farmers and, uh, and locally. That, that's the difficulty, uh, that's a major difficulty. A third point is that the, we need to have this system approach that embraces all the complexity of the socio-ecological interaction that all are local and different from one region or even from one village to, to another. And it needs serious public funding that compensates for the investment gaps. Uh, actually, when we see the policies, uh, it's mainly uh, subsides for uh, chemicals that are imported, for instance. Uh, and this is far to be the, the solution. We need to have creative farmers that are ready to experiment and take the risk also. Uh, responsible chains and consumer, uh, I believe in the association uh, when uh, near the cities where uh, consumers can be part of the process also. Uh, this is the next point, the articulation with the cities for energy, nutrient recycling also. New legislation that promotes change, this is very um, important. Uh, you know in Europe, uh, for instance, uh, agroforestry was restricted just because the subsides of uh, Open Union for Agriculture was only for uh, crops that didn't include trees. So this was a direct uh, obstacle to the development of agroforestry, for instance. We need so new legislation and also a way to attract the youth uh, to farming. Uh, this is a very important point because we saw uh, the, uh, our colleague uh, who spoke um, the, before, before me, he told that the first thing the young Africans, they want to just to leave the farm because it, it's too hard and it's, it means to, to stay poor. So we, we need new solutions for that. Uh, thank you for your attentions. Um, thank you.